coming up on Theater Talk. There's a columnist from the National Review yep. there. Yeah, and he that. took the cell phone out of her hands yeah. and threw it across the theater and into yeah. a wall. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. I want to do everything to have one way of evaluating experience. Does it cause me pleasure or pain? From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, this week we're going to talk about two powerful productions off-Broadway in New York City. And they are? Coming up in a minute, we're going to have David Malloy and Rachel Chavkin from Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. But first, we are going to talk about Sontag Reborn a portrait of the important cultural uh, essayist, Susan Sontag. I thought you were going to say Sondheim Reborn there for I a almost, you know, I've been <laughs> saying that. You I've been almost saying said that. I've been Sondheim saying Reborn. That. Wait, which, which, I'm going to say that the... But, you know, what Stephen Sondheim is, in a way, the Susan Sontag of the American musical theater, because <laughs> wow. he was the true... He was, well, ladies, what well, was he not? He was the intellectual of the American musical theater, as Susan Sontag was a popular intellectual. Right, I have could say, I buy that. No, but we we could say that she she brought intellectualism into the mainstream. Well, of perhaps American our culture. guests will say that, and they are <laughs> Marianne <laughs> Weems, <laughs> who is the director of Sontag Reborn. Marianne is the artistic director of the Builders Association, which is really a very celebrated ex, uh, experimental. Avant-garde, shouldn't say avant-garde. John Simon says, once you say something's avant-garde, it's not. But avant-garde <laughs> theater company, which she founded in, what, 1994? Yes. Right? right? Yes. She directed it. And here with us is also Mo Angelos, who adapted Susan Sondheim's journals for Sondheim. <laughs> Susan Sondheim, I think you just said. You said you're <laughs> did I? Susan <laughs> did. It's all right. Well, that's okay. You know it. You know viewers, I mean, Susan Sontag. <laughs> and she also plays Susan Sontag in a remarkable performance we will discuss. Mo is a um, founding member of the nationally famous Five Lesbian Brothers, and she has been a member of the Builders Association since the year 2000. But she's All without right. that white streak, the famous Sontag right, white streak in your hair. I have hair. no Didn't bring it today. But no. before <laughs> Michael goes wild on his affection <laughs> for Sontag Reborn, I want to say that some of the young adults in this office, where I work here at CUNY TV, do not know who Susan Sontag is. Mm -hmm. So I want you, Mo, please, to bring them up to speed on what is the importance of Susan Sontag. Who was she? Uh, Susan Sontag was a cultural critic, essayist, novelist, filmmaker. She actually wrote a few plays, too. Uh, she, um, uh, let's see, I guess came to prominence in the early 60s uh, with, I guess, her first big essay was Notes on Camp. And she was 31 at the time. She was 31 years old. It was published in the Partisan Review, which was a small um uh, review with probably a circulation of 10,000 or something like that, and it shot her to uh, fame, cultural icon status. Superstardom of cultural yeah. fame. What was it about that essay? Because that is probably uh, her most famous essay, Notes on Camp. What, Mo and Marianne, what is in that essay, which I'm sure you guys have studied, that would have attracted the attention of the mainstream media mm. to this little, little partisan yeah. magazine that she yeah. What did she tap into that made her the most famous intellectual of her time, do you think? Well, if I may, Please. I think that the point is she tapped into something that was a kind of a cultural zeitgeist, like a moment that was about to happen, which was gay culture. You know, gay culture. Yeah. The humor, the, you know, tragedy, the whole nine yards, and that she, this was kind of her thing over and over again, is that she identified these cultural popular moments and then elevated them into like, you know, high culture status. Mm -hmm. And that was her real, you know, in intellectual capacity and her ability was that she could traverse both those worlds, high and low. Well, because with the camp essay, she is taking what you would think is like sort of, you know, people who are impersonating Judy Garland or an yeah. obsession with Judy Garland <laughs> or something. And she's elevating it to a kind of cultural status level, that these are people who have a knowledge of this subterranean mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. that is a great world, 
right. that have never really been Appreciate. looked at other than mm -hmm. as freaks. Yeah. And, and that she's, they have, giving, she's giving them their due. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would right. you? I, I mean, it's a little hard now in our current 2013 world to imagine gay culture being very not in the mainstream because it is so saturated in the mainstream. Did you now. see the Tony Awards? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but there was a time in olden times, which is not that long ago, actually, <laughs> where, right. you know, camp was a sensibility as she outlined it, that was everyone sort of understood when something was campy, but they didn't necessarily have a name for it. Right. You know, and, and she sort of pointed to it and said, this is the name for this thing. Right. What's so fascinating is you're portraying Susan Sontag when she was, from the time she was 14, mm -hmm. through her adolescence and, and, and young, and her 20s, mm -hmm. and writing these journals and discussing her reading, which was so instrumental. Absolutely. And then you're also portraying old Susan Sontag, Sontag, tag, old Susan Sontag. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Let me take over here. You, yeah. Let me, let me, <laughs> I'm going to stab I, you I, with I, my I, pen let me take over. just to be candid. Side by this. side by Sontag. This, this is very interesting. So just tell us, she's 14 years old. Mm -hmm. What's the family like? What's mm -hmm. the background like? And yeah. why do books become the most important thing in her life? Well, she does not come from an intellectual family at all. Um, her uh, her father, well, her stepfather, actually, Nathan Sontag, was a decorated Air Force pilot mm. um, who her mother remarried. Her mother, Judith, uh, no, that's her sister. Her mother, Mildred, remarried Nathan Sontag after her biological father died of tuberculosis when she was five years old. So she ended up in Southern California uh, at North Hollywood High, which she says in you know, in the play, childhood, a terrible waste of time. You know, she just could not wait to grow up and get away and have her own life. And books taught her how to be an adult, um, you know, in, in a certain way, right? She studied them, I think. Um, what were the early books that she read? Oh my God, what did she not read? She was voracious and, yeah. and continued that throughout her life, just thousands and thousands. I mean, she would read anything. And that was sort of her point, was that she, you know, she could read book catalogs and magazines and... She, well, you knew her. How fast did she read? Um, I don't think she was a speed reader. She was just obsessive. Yeah. But in any case, she read high culture. She read everything. She read Proust and Gide and... When she no. was a kid, she when was she was a kid. When she yeah. was fourteen, she was reading yeah. Dostoevsky and I was like, reading, like you. I was reading. No, I was reading Agatha Christie oh, and Ian Fleming. <laughs> right. Two writers, I would argue, by the way, that you should read when you're young because they're great writers. <laughs> yeah. They teach you how to write a Ian sentence. Fleming, that's really I'll buy that with Fleming. Muscular yeah. and Agatha Christie is wonderful. I mean, the way the way they, and I I bet you Susan Sontag would agree with me. Well, she I probably would appreciate it. Agatha muscular Christie. is an excellent word because she was building that muscle and yeah. you know I think that was the thing and something that's traced through the whole show is her aspiration to be a writer yeah. was yeah. you know and her, her intellectual her whole confidence life. yes she was oddly confident but she was I mean by the time so the, by the time she was 16 she was admitted at the University of Chicago you know and passed uh, and um, you know tested. into the graduate yeah. school she tested out of undergrad so she was you know, she was intelligent, but beyond that, she had this will to write. But you knew her, right? I did. How did you, when did you first meet her? I met her in 1990. I used to, I was the dramaturg at the Worcester Group. Mm -hmm. I was raised by wolves at the Worcester Group. Yeah. And, um, and long story, Ron Vodder, who was a brilliant actor in that time, was a friend of hers, and she approached Ron and I about making a show together, and so we... Um, dove in and, you know, we used to hang out in her penthouse in London Terrace and, you know, kick around ideas and it was... I love the intellectual with the penthouse in London. Dude. She probably, probably rent control that she paid 12... No, oh, listen, <laughs> she had just, I mean, I met her at the height of her glory because she had just um, written The Volcano Lover. She had just yeah. gotten to Mac MacArthur. Right. So she, that was why she was in you know, And the MacArthur the is a grant you get half a million dollars for being a genius. Yeah. And, yeah. I, but speaking of being a genius, I want to talk about your stunning production quickly. Oh, thank you. Where you have Mo, <laughs> you have Mo as the older Susan Sontag on a projection 
and then Mo in real life is sitting there on the stage being young Susan Sontag writing her journals and the older Susan Sontag is annotating her text from Mm -hmm. the future and then you have these gorgeous projections which have to do with the reading and what's going on and it's like really like Sontag looking at Sontag looking at Sontag it's a stunning production visually gorgeous work as well yeah. as intellectually stunning work. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, I we have incredible designers that we yeah. work with, you know, genius video designer and sound and so it's an ensemble piece in that regard. I mean, there's one actor, but there's many, many players who are who create that world. You know, and the world is to reflect Susan's mind. It's it's uncanny what you do up there on the stage. Thanks. But I want to go back oh, surprisingly to effective as the New York Times. Right, but I, <laughs> right, 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 right. But I, but and they I, did. But I'm interesting because I, I would like to have met her, and I think she's quite fascinating. And you knew her, so you met you her know. in 1990. Yeah. And uh, was she intimidating? What was she like to be around? Um, it really depended on you know the many moods of Susan Sontag. I mean, she was extremely kind and generous if she liked you. So I I was lucky enough to be in that ballpark. Um, I mean, generous, you know, philosophically, with her time, conceptually, with her ideas, with talking about your ideas. Um, but, you know, she could be very biting. And, really? Yeah, and she didn't suffer fools. And, really? you know. Were you ever around when she oh my God, cut somebody? Fabulous. Out? fabulous All right, tell, tell, give, give us an example <laughs> of how she would cut somebody. I want to hear this. Um, oh, I mean, there's a million. One tiny thing was we were at the public going to a Godard film when they still showed films at the public and when anyone cared about Godard. Yeah. And some, a friend of V.S. Naipaul's came up, who I think she had just been on a panel with, and she just looked at the person and said, not now. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, this is what I love about it. You bring up Naipaul. Naipaul, one of my favorite writers. Uh, Naipaul, uh, Sontag, Gore Vidal. These Fabulous. people, as you said, they don't suffer fools gladly. Yeah. But they're not, they, they were not that aloof or that remote. If right. they brought you in, they could be really kind of warm and wonderful. Mm-hmm. But if you came to them with pretension yes. that they saw through right away, you would have your legs cut right out mm-hmm. from under you. Mm-hmm. You'd the stiletto in the back, and you would not even have known that you'd been carved right. and served. It's at a surgical. Party. Surgical. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. So when you play her, do you play the soft side, mm-hmm. or do you play the harder edge side? The el- well, um, I think you kind of get it all. Yeah. Uh, but you know, these these are journals. They're deeply personal. It's all from her journals. Yeah. All the text. You work with the son, uh, with, with Sontag's son. Yes. With yes. David, David Reef. I mean, he, he yeah he worked, worked with. Was, what, 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 but you guys have studied the, the journals. Where is the insecurity in her? I mean, we think of her as this imperious, mm-hmm. great yeah. public mm-hmm. intellectual. Right. Yeah. But there's got to have been some sure. insecurity, some sure. doubt, some self-doubt. Where is that? At every page. It, She's yeah. just writhing with insecurity <laughs> and kind of did until the end of her life. I mean, I think we all, you know, carry those struggles. But and also she when was, she was 14, yeah. she was yeah. excruciatingly, you know, aware of her lack of prowess and you, you have her coming into her homosexuality which wasn't exactly accepted as yeah. you said before in the yeah. time yeah how did she deal and, and, and when does that kick into place in the diaries oh god when she's 16. she knows well is there she, a girl that she's in love with oh yes <laughs> many many girls oh yes who who one of them is irene fornes as a matter of fact really yeah Marie, I, I remember some play called Mud that Irina Fernandez did yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Theater for the New City. Yeah. So did Sontag only go for the like, intellectual avant-garde types, or did she ever go for yeah. the cheerleaders? No. Um, no, she never went for a She cheer- never no, went no. for the cheerleaders. No, no. Never went for the socias, no. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I think Annie Leibovitz was like a big step into the popular world for her. That's probably right. the biggest step. The hottest babe, all right. All right, we've got to wrap it up, but I, ha- I have to ask you one last thing about Susan Sontag. Do you think, having looked at her diaries, looked at her writing, is it going to, is it going to last? Are we just remember her as the intellectual with the hmm. white streak in her hair? Is the writing good enough, or did she in some way sell herself out and become almost too popular? Oh, God. Um... Well, I think, you know, on photography, for instance, which is her collection of essays looking at how photography 
uh, fits into our culture, how image capture and you know image consumption uh, works in our culture is still very fresh and vibrant, and it's still very widely taught in colleges. Um, I think that will have you know have some legs, as we say in the theater. And Marianne, what do you think about the novels? I think Volcano Lover was the culmination of her ambitions and also her her ability to create fiction. I mean, it is a spectacular read, and um, I think it will live on absolutely. And you know, she. I mean, some of the ones before that are shaky, but she needed to do those to get to where she was. So, yeah, I think that's one of the top hundred. Yeah. And she wrote, She wrote. I, did she try to write some plays, didn't she? Yes. Yes, she wrote a play called Alice in Bed direct, that Eva Von Hove directed at New York Theatre Workshop, actually. It was at ART, um, too. Nobody mm -hmm. loved it. I mean, it's really, it is about Alice James, and it's yeah. about how she took to her bed for 20 years, yeah. um, which is full of, you know, promise, but, um, and listen, I think if, it's okay. It's very, very abstract. Well, listen, if, if Bette Midler can do Sue Manger's just taking to her couch for 90 Seriously. minutes, you can <laughs> Alice James taking to her bed for 90 minutes. Maybe they should have cast Bette. <laughs> <laughs> no. Jane, when, what's her name played it, right? Yeah, Joan, oh, I hate to break it to you, Mo, but when, when they move when they move this play to Broadway, you're being replaced by Bent Midler. As, as, as <laughs> oh, please <laughs> go ahead, darling. My, my <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> Throw in a couple of numbers. I think it'll yeah, pick it right, right up. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Susan Sontag, the musical, coming to Broadway soon enough. Sondheim on Sontag on Sondheim. That's what we're <laughs> oh, that's next. good. That's good. That's good. All right. So, all right, uh, uh, Mo Angelus. Yes. And Marianne Weems, thank you very much for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. The play is? Sontag Reborn. At the theater? The New York Theater Workshop yes. on East 4th Street. Moving to Broadway with Bette Midler. We hope so, <laughs> but with Mo Angelus. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for being thank our guest. Hey, thank you for having us. There's a war going on out there somewhere And Andre is in tears There's a war So, Michael, now we turn our sights to another excellent production downtown in New York City. Yes, uh, Natasha and Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, based on, I must say, my second favorite novel of all time. I hate to get a little pretentious on you, but I love <laughs> War and Peace. Tolstoy wrote it, I believe, when he was... 30, 31 or 32, and I read it when I was that age because I thought if he can write it at 31, if he can write a masterpiece at 31, at least I can read it at 31. Well, that's right, and our guests include David Malloy, who at a very young age, I don't know if you're even 31 yet, has written the masterpiece of adapting <laughs> a um, segment of War and Peace. A few years past. Uh, oh, all right. Thank You've you. You've adapted <laughs> War and Peace, uh, a little bit of War and Peace, to mm -hmm. become Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. And you wrote the music, and you play Pierre. And then you have made this marvelous show, which has been pulled together and brilliantly directed by Rachel Chavkin, in a show which is like, well, it's, it trivializes it to call it dinner theater, but we're eating at the same time we're watching this musical. This is on your program. You are at the opera. And it is the hit of downtown New York. They've made a restaurant to do your play. And so I have to ask It's not a restaurant, it's a tent. They made a tent. There's a tent down there where restaurant I live. in a tent. Down in the restaurant old meatpacking district. There's yeah. now a tent. It's like Cirque du Soleil for Tolstoy. <laughs> well, it has walls. It has walls. And you think you're inside a structure that's more, more substantial than a tent. And the air conditioning. And it has a bathroom. And, and the bathrooms are very good. The bathrooms are very nice. They're right out of uh, uh, Catherine the Great's Russia. You yes. Know, and and, and when you're nice. not in Catherine the Great's um, uh, restroom, you are in but Dave Malloy's. Susan, we should yeah. explain to our viewers. Uh, <laughs> so you take, imagine, you take Tolstoy's War and Peace, which I believe is about 900 pages. Yeah, that's a lot. Including this brilliant treatise about Napoleon and philosophy at the end that you guys don't use, and they have boiled it. There, down. There's a little. There's one yes. line. There's why. Yeah. 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 But they but, 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 but they have taken this this masterpiece of of literature, and they've turned it into a snappy, fun, lively, off Broadway 
dinner theater, again, I think is the wrong word to use for it, but uh, the hottest show off Broadway right now. So how did you do it, and why did you? <laughs> I mean, I gotta ask you, David, I mean, David, yeah. so you're sitting around, you're, I don't know, you went to Yale, comparative yeah. literature, you read <laughs> War and Peace, and you think, you know what? This is dinner theater. War and well, Peace is dinner theater. I actually, I, I actually read the book while I was working on a cruise ship. So I was playing <laughs> piano on a cruise ship, I believe in, in either Bermuda or the Caribbean. I can't remember which, which, which one of them. I did, I did several cruise ship stints in my 20s. Um, so I had obviously a lot of spare time on my hands, so a lot of reading time. And actually had a girlfriend on land. And one of the ways that we stayed together was, you know, similar to you, we said, okay, well, let's just take the biggest book ever, War and Peace, and let's read it together. We can do this. I'm curious, though, what did you see in War and Peace that would you think this is a musical? Oh, well, you know, and it's, it's just this like 70 page sliver of War and Peace. It's this very, very tightly uh, compact love story, basically, about this woman, young girl, Natasha, who kind of falls for a roguish character and, and basically almost ruins herself. And that's told in parallel with the story of Pierre, who's kind of having this spiritual crisis, crisis. in his life. And you play um, Pierre. And I play Pierre. And, and, and at the time I was reading it, I very much related to Pierre because Pierre is kind of a. A, a social misfit and kind of awkward in groups and I was working on this cruise ship where I didn't really fit in very well I felt <laughs> it was a very weird time um, so what, what I liked about this particular section was that there's kind of these these two stories running in parallel and they only come together at the end and it, and it felt structurally like it, it really reminded me of like you know classic musicals where you have like an A love story and a B love story mm -hmm. you know, you've got Sky Masterson and you've got Nathan Detroit and so like we had those two You have the two people who really should be together mm -hmm. but they don't know they should be together until they've gone through the journey of sure. the show. Yeah and in fact in our show they don't even really they just kind of come together for a moment at the end of the show and then you know ten years later they get married and all that but that's that's well, we know that we know we, that. we have a feeling but Rachel now how did you get involved in it as the director so, and why did you conceive of it as this sort of whole dinner theater? Well, I think the, the dinner theater aspect came in part from, directly from Dave. Dave had had this magical night in Moscow where he had found this sort of subterranean club. You're on a cruise <laughs> ship and you wind up in Moscow? No, 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 this was years and years later. So, so on the cruise ship I read the book and realized that, and I kind of tucked the idea away in the back of my head. Oh, there's a 70 page sliver, one day I'll write an opera based on that. And then six or so years later, I got this commission from Ars Nova, and they said, you can do whatever you want, and I sheepishly proposed War and Peace, and they said yes. And so then as part of research for that, then I went to Russia. So to Ars Nova and funded your trip to Russia? Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Did they really? I went to Russia. No, no, they didn't fund the trip to Russia. I mean, they were great. They, they gave us developmental workshops, and you know, for a year and a half or so, we developed it there. But no trip to Russia. But so no, you went no to Russia, to and Russia. then you got involved because? Well, so Dave and I had worked together on two projects prior, and when we were working on, I guess, our first project mm -hmm. together up at Vassar College, um, we Dave mentioned, this was in 2009, and Dave mentioned this long-time idea, sort of back-of-the-brain idea, to adapt War and Peace into an opera um, and so I think I began rereading the book then and I love this rereading the book like I read it I, I, I had not really understood it <laughs> but I had read it I had looked at the pages and um, and then Dave mentioned sort of described this night he had in this cafe and the idea that he had had, um, there was a, a string trio that was playing in the cafe, um, and he'd ended up sitting next to the viola player and had this really intimate experience with the viola, but the cello was across the way and wanted to have, um, take this idea of the musicians surrounding the audience um, and have vodka and dumplings, and wouldn't that be fun? Um, and so Mimi, Leanne, our set designer, and I sort of took that and ran. Um, and it felt very important to me to preserve certain aspects of period, which ends up being the costumes, mm. um, because it seemed really important that the audience be able to release into the melodrama of the story. You know, you can't meet Natasha with modern day sort of feminist morality. She mm. just <laughs> she just makes all the wrong choices. And you hopefully both want to wring her neck and uh, embrace her at the end of the story. Um, 
And so that was where sort of the, the period costumes came from. But then this contemporary club around came from a lot of Mimi's research. Uh, Mimi also got this random trip to Russia for another gig that she was doing and kind of came back with we these. We have to get on this gravy train. <laughs> right? This, Kiev, this chicken Kiev train. I want to get to Russia, too. I've never been there. You guys are oh, like, it's you know, good. Her description, well, I have not been to Russia, actually, yet. So hopefully for. Well, hopefully we'll tour there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but what was interesting about, though, I, uh, it, dinner theater is the wrong word. Opera, actually, is mm -hmm. the right word. It is an opera. It is a sung through mm -hmm. musical. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. no dialogue. There's one tiny piece of dialogue at Little the end. A little sliver of yeah. it. Yes, yes. So when you were right, you wrote the music, right, mm -hmm. for it? So, so what is the style of music that you're aiming for? Because it's not mm. it's not <laughs> 19th century European, although it echoes that. I mean, there there are definitely pieces is, of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely, in, like, you know, thinking about what the sound of the show would be, there were kind of a couple different worlds I looked to. And one was definitely, like, you know, period music, so 19th century Russian music. So I listened to a lot of... Tchaikovsky and, and Borodin and even a little later Rachmaninoff and things like that. Um, so there's that kind of sound and then also a lot of like Russian folk music I was listening to. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have you know the accordion is in there and the guitars and, and there's this beautiful scene in War and Peace where Natasha goes into the countryside and hears this guitar player who's playing yeah, the old it's a Russian lovely folk songs. Scene. Yeah. 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 Um, but then in addition to that, you know, at my own personal musical taste kind of veer more towards you know indie rock and electronica and things like that and things things a lot of modern music which is really aggressively using electronic sounds which I just really love and so when I was looking at this story so basically you know Natasha starts off as this as this young innocent and then she gets kind of electrified and sexualized by this character Anatole Karagin who walks in and so that felt like this dramaturgical justification to introduce electronica into the score as well so that's where you have this kind of collision of sounds where you have these like Mm. Russian folk sounds and classical Russian music, but then also more contemporary electronic. But they also, you send up our, our our image of Russians. I mean, you you're kind of playing with that notion of the 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 the, the, the Russian vibe and the strutting Russian guys. You know, you do play a little bit with that kind of music. Then mm -hmm. you know, we don't have the whirling dervish. Well, that's Turkish. So <laughs> don't quite have, although they all kind of mix together in that part. The of Don Cossack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we don't. Yeah, we, we, we have a little like you know a bow to the. Soul. We think of Russians mm -hmm. as yeah. Cossacks here and there. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a little. Uh, well, in fact, my ancestry is Latvian, so I grew up yeah. you know, with uh, with you know, going to these big Latvian parties where people ah. actually would have these like epic mm. Latvian sing-alongs. You know, it's not quite Russia, but it is still this very Slavic feeling of, of group drinking and group singing. Oh, yeah. oh so yeah. that influenced yeah. you. That well, you know, oh, I, for yeah. sure. As a, as a, when I was a, a student here in New York, we used to go out to uh, Brighton Beach, where the Russian immigrants lived. Sure. Mm. And there was a restaurant out there, a Georgian restaurant. And I don't mean Atlanta, Georgia, but a Georgian proper Georgian mm -hmm. restaurant, which had a little tiny disco ball that would swirl around. Yeah. And there would used to be weddings out there. Yeah. And they would start off boisterous and fun, but they would then drink so much, inevitably, they would wind, wind up trying to kill each other oh, at some point. But that's, <laughs> but is that, that's the Russian character that Tolstoy understands, that there is this passion and expansiveness and love and the double-edged sword of that is that they can turn on a dime and slit your throat and kill you. Yeah. Totally. And well, I in think fact, that we have a duel. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. have a duel <laughs> and we moment. have yeah, that, that moment of, uh, I mean, I think the, the idea of sort of decadence felt really, really important, yep. which is in part why the space is made to feel so opulent. Yep. Um, because, of course, immediately after this section in the novel is when Napoleon descends on Moscow right. and the city will burn to the ground. And so sort of this idea of the Titanic, the band playing as the Titanic mm -hmm. sinks, yep. was something that I really wanted to get. Very much so. You've captured yeah. a world that is going to be obliterated. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so Within you get year. that kind of violent drinking that you really only get in an incredibly cold culture yeah. um, where you just need to pass the winter somehow or a culture that is sort of so at the ends of uh, an epoch, at the ends of a moment. Right, time. but also you're dealing with a culture that is, it's been rich for so long. Yeah. It's kept all these mm. people down for so long. Yeah. It's just lived on the backs of other people for so long. And it cannot go on. Hmm. What does that remind us of? 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, which is, I think, yeah. why is the contemporary strands work. Of? Absolutely. Yeah. When, you know, when Dave brought in the song that has become the dual song, that really heavy techno moment, um, it was like, oh, yeah, I can see this happening now. It's uh, the aristocracy partying away while the, you know, while a massive army is marching mm -hmm. towards uh, towards it and the city is headed for it. That's too. how I feel, uh, feel as a Verizon wireless subscriber. <laughs> the big old government has been listening in to my sure. phone. <laughs> oh, and you know they have. <laughs> and, and, and reading the mean emails you write me. All right, listen, before we go. No, before I go, I want to ask you guys this. You are unknown to this town. You're young, struggling artists, right? <laughs> no, no, oh. you're, you're, you're young, struggling. Thank All sorry. of a sudden, you are now having, you have the hottest show off Broadway. Charles Isherwood and the New York Times are giving you a rave review. Have you all gotten agent up? We are both you now had looking to move to going. Broadway? Is everyone descending on you? Do they want you to write? Do the Weislers come to you and want you to write a musical for them? Do you have dreams of a Tony Award next year, <laughs> <laughs> David? I mean, no. Yes, sure. no, no. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, I mean, yes, no, honestly, no, yes. I, I, that's yeah. question. I mean, um, no, I mean, it's definitely a very exciting time for the two of us. Yeah. In our, yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen my life change a little bit and, and seeing new things When you say your life has horizon. changed, in what way? What do you mean? Oh, just, I mean, just in the, yeah, like new opportunities have come up and, and it seems like it, opportunities I hadn't really thought of before and, and in terms of, you know, going away from the downtown world because we've definitely mm -hmm. kind of grew up in the experimental downtown theater world and so now to suddenly be kind of thrust onto this larger stage You're is, a hit. is yep. exciting. Yeah. You know the difference between the downtown world and the uptown world? Money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, it makes a big difference. And you, have you the same experience? Are people yeah. now coming to you as a director? We would like you to do something that we're going to pay you to do. Yeah, it's lovely to get paid for it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, Dave and I have a couple new projects that we're getting to work on, and mm -hmm. I think the challenge is how do you sort of stay um, uh, uh, Ingenuitive, ingenuitive. <laughs> um, how do you stay creative in sort of a fundamental way that poor theater demands that you do because you don't have sort of the tricks that money can buy you? Right. Um, and so I think that's you know going to be a continued challenge. And uh, also, I mean, I think for me too, like like just staying smart about yeah. what we're actually going to do next and yeah. what to say yes to and what to say no to. Um, but but yeah. I've seen this happen a lot, though. What you have to do is, since you now are in the uh, hot seat. And you'll be in the cold seat again, believe me, because you might do the big one that fails and oh, yeah. you're, you know, you're on the scrap heap. Your history. But what you should do is, because a lot of people are going to you now mm -hmm. with money, you should continue to pursue the things that you want to do. Yes. Just now, the people will give you money to do them, and it won't be quite so hard. Yeah, maintaining that dream list is actually like one of the biggest yeah. responsibilities that I feel like is the largest change that I'm experiencing is just the need to carve time in a way I hadn't before mm. to maintain that dream list so that I'm ready when someone's like, what do you want to do? Here's a, here's a commission, here's yeah. a possibility. And, and, and don't let them come to you and say, we would like you to direct you know, I don't know, Ghostbusters 3. Uh, yes, not You yet. say, actually, we would like to no, do... One. Uh, one, two, right. one. <laughs> so not until your drug habit gets too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's it. No, but you go to those people. You go to the Weislers and the, 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 the Viertels and the Frankels and the, the Bruges Kagan. and the Schuberts. And, <laughs> and they come to you and they say, uh, what would you like to do? And you say, this is what we want to do. This is, what, this is our next one. But until then, it's Natasha Pierre where they give you these shakers. Yes. Mm. They give you dinner. They give you shakers. <laughs> now, recently, there was a very a notorious event which happened at your theater. Oh. Yes, and I oh. wanted to get your I wanted to get your take on that. There have actually been countless notorious no, but, events. Right, but, <laughs> but there was yeah. one. But that's the because one, people yeah. drink at your show. Yes. yes. But the, <laughs> one that made the, the one that made the papers, yeah. the one that made the papers, and you were there. Tell me what happened. Uh, you know, from from my perspective, I was actually playing piano at the time, and it was the beginning of it's in the beginning of Act Two. It's like one of the biggest ballads in the show. Oh, this and woman starts singing yeah. this beautiful song. And the reviewer from uh, no, there's a columnist from the National Review yep. there. Yeah, I, and, and I mean, what I heard at first was just like out of the corner of my eye, I like kind of heard some commotion. Then I looked up, and I heard a very loud sound, like something hitting the ground. And then I saw this woman, and then I heard another sound, which sounded like someone slapping someone. And then I saw a woman come down the steps <laughs> and just march the entire length of the theater. And it's an immersive production, yes. so it's yeah. like she's just in front of everyone. Yeah. 
right in front of the girl who's singing and then march out the giant double doors and start yelling at our house manager Specifically, and now what had happened? Yeah. What had happened was yeah. okay. she had yeah. been on her phone texting or Googling or During something. During your play. Not oh. talking, but just with the yes. light. During the play. And the light is very yeah. distracting because like, I mean, we're, you know, yeah. she was literally this close to yeah. someone. And I guess the man had asked her several times during Act One to stop, and during the intermission, the house management and security had come and asked her to stop. And at the beginning of Act Two, she continued, and he said to her something like, "Can you please stop that?" And she's like, "Just don't look." And <laughs> he and said to him, "Just, she said, don't, Just look. don't look." And then apparently they had some other, that is a few the time other words. You take the bottle of wine and smack it over. Well, her. well what instead, he what he did, did was he that. took the cell phone out of her hands yeah. and threw it across the theater and yeah. into a wall. And yeah. what did she scream? Well, she walked out of the doors and said, security, that man, and then the doors slammed shut on her. <laughs> so I actually thought, because I was taking notes at the time with my assistant director, who did witness it all, mm -hmm. and I was looking elsewhere, and I thought that actually she had been molested up, mm -hmm. in, the, mm -hmm. up in the banquette, and that luckily I turned out told. to not be the case, or at least molested in that right. type of right. variety. Um, I, I think as a team, we were kind of split about it because we had been um, very upset about sort of this rampant use of cell phones throughout the play. So this was a, 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 a sort of epidemic um, versus a singular incident. And yet and the so, whole time you're in kind of encouraging the audience to... Well, I mean, that's, that's yeah, what's that's so the difficult part about... Of this, yeah, it's uh, the fine this end line. of this era of all this drunkenness right. that is going on. Yeah. This decadent I mean, society is unraveling. At, at tables together and meeting their neighbors and yeah. talking and laughing a little texting. bit. not but not, not yeah, and it's just like finding that fine yeah. line. And then, but then they came and they made the guy who'd thrown the phone. What, what was his name? Do we remember him? Uh, Heaven. Well, we'll put William it. William F. Buckley yeah. from the right. National, National, National Exactly. Right. They made him leave, right? <laughs> they did, well, they asked him to come out. I think to uh, try to address sort of what had happened, because I think at that point. And you got and you're still playing the piano and the oh, show's yeah. still going oh, on. Oh, show yeah. totally He's still, still going on. I know they were both offered like tickets to other shows. Because yeah. of, you know, well, she so said she was going to schedule. sue him. Did that ever? I, I think I'm, she is, I think, oh. not sued him, but they're worth it. So there was a lot of posting. This got in all the papers. There was a yes. lot of posting. I, had I, I have to say, I, I'm totally on his side because, uh, you know, you're right next to the person yes. next to you. You're sitting like in a, and, and then, but people defended it saying, well, the boundaries aren't there anymore because you're in a restaurant, so you don't know if you can text or not. And I'm thinking, well, it, I'm thinking, you're watching a performance. There's people standing right there performing for you. You don't know that you have to not be rudely texting. Uh, yeah, that's what's so appalling. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think the, I think the major sort of thing that you can say kind of against him is that he could have injured someone in the yes, throwing of the phone. So, so it was probably not the best way to have I know, But on the it. other hand, listen, you're, you're pushing the boundaries with the theater. It's an immersive, I think is your, your <laughs> yeah. word, performance. Um, people are eating. Mm -hmm. People are drinking. Yeah. If somebody stood up, and started dancing. It's happened. It would happened. you oh. incorporate their well, dance? Well, again, it's a yeah. fine line. Like, like that happened like two nights ago. There's a scene where we are passing out letters, yeah. and this woman got this letter to deliver to Natasha. And usually, they just pass it like you mm -hmm. know from audience member to audience member. But apparently, this woman just like <laughs> stood. I was actually wasn't there that night, but this woman stood up and just like slow danced her way all the way across the theater <laughs> to give it to Natasha. And the people the people described it as mom dancing. She was like. This, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> year old woman and, I know, but uh, and it was listen, wonderful mom dancing across the floor at least you're being more involved totally, where's your totally. text yeah. listen there are well, that's what it's all about for me it's like yeah. it's like if you're engaged and you're making noise it's fine if you're not engaged I know but fine. the thing though as a performer as you must know I mean if you're doing this immersive kind of theater and you're you might have people who are drinking who might get a little boisterous and carried away oh yeah. as a great performer you have to bring them into the moment and then know exactly when to shut it down totally and put them them back with their date or their family mm -hmm. and that's old-fashioned showbiz oh yeah uh, we got to wrap it up uh, the show is called Natasha and Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 uh, at a tent it's a what is it called it's, it's, it's the hippest spot in town what do you call the club casino 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 sounds like casino. it's a wonderful evening it's a wonderful evening and, you and get it was black uh, bread conceived and, and the music by David Malloy and directed by Rachel Chapkin 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 <laughs> and Rachel Chapkin. I got it right. Yes, you uh, Natasha and Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812 down at the, tell us again what the tent is called. Casino. The Casino. 
It's known as the Meat Packing District on 13th Street and Washington. And you, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.